If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, look, for the first 49 minutes, we do our introductory current events conversation. After that, we get into the fitness portion weird. of this episode. Here's what we talked about in the first 49 minutes. We talked about one of our favorite partners, Viori, getting a $45 million investment to expand their business. This is probably because they're extremely successful already by making the best athleisure wear clothes. They're you'll killing find, the game. You'll find anywhere. Now, they are one of our sponsors. If you go to Viori Clothing, that's V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash mind pump and use the code that's listed on the page once you pull it up, you'll get 25% off. Then we talked about one of our other sponsors, Organifi. They're the makers of extremely uh, organic or extremely uh, beneficial supplements that are all organic. They're now working with one of our friends, Paul Check, which we think is awesome because Paul is very picky with who he works with. Mm. So it just goes to show you that Organifi is a They're great doing company. Some right. Great company to get your supplements from. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump, you'll get a full 20% off. Then Justin talks about how he almost broke the raft at Lake Tahoe and killed his entire family. <laughs> you make it sound horrible, <laughs> I know. man. Yeah. Adam talks about sleeping on the couch. It's it's start, It's all starting, Justin. <laughs> I know. We talked about how uh, boutique fitness facilities are the ones that are causing all the growth in the gym business right now. We talked about the next Matrix that's coming out. I'm so excited about this. Yes. Uh, we Neo. And we also talked about how Apple is investing $6 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars into original content. We're about to see awesome shows yeah. come out of Apple. It's coming. Then we got into the fitness portion of the episode. The first question, what are the benefits and gains from conventional deadlifts versus sumo deadlifts and high bar squats versus low bar squats? So we talk all about the differences and similarities in that part of the episode. Next question, is three to five minutes of rest in between sets necessary for strength or can you rest a little shorter, like one and a half to two minutes? So we talk all about the benefits of shorter rest periods versus longer rest periods. Next question, this person wants to know what our opinions are on artificial colors, flavors in foods and supplements. So what do we think about them? Are they detrimental? Are they beneficial? Or are they just benign? And the final question, this person wants to know what our bucket list items are. So we talk about the things we want to do before we die. Also, this month, for the first time ever, Maps Prime and Maps Prime Pro are both 50, a full 50% off. You heard it. Now, Maps Prime helps teach you how to prime your body properly for your workouts. Now, it's individualized, so it's not a generic priming program. There's a test in Maps Prime. You take the test. You figure out what works for your body, what doesn't work for your body. Then you design your priming, also known as warm-up session. It takes about 10, 15 minutes. And when you do this before your workout, it makes your workout much more effective. You get better mobility, greater ranges of motion, better muscle activation. It'll make any workout or even competition more effective. So if you're a competitor and you're about to compete in a tournament of some sort, prime your body beforehand and your performance should improve. Now, MAPS Prime Pro is correctional exercise. It's all about correctional exercise. It works on all the major joints of the body, and it teaches you how to keep them healthy and pain-free or how to treat chronic pain yourself. Of course, proceed with caution, get your doctor's approval, but if you follow Prime Pro, you can solve some of your chronic pain issues. Both those programs, 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code Prime 50, P-R-I-M-E, 5-0, no space for the discount. Did you guys see the massive infusion well, you of money? I'm excited. When I said massive? Yes. The massive infusion of investor capital that one of our favorite partners just got? Viore, I just posted it on my story the other day. Wow. 45. They are chugging away. $45 million. We've been telling people. Do you know what the money's for? Climbing to the top. No, actually, I don't. What are they using it for? To open more stores. Oh, they're going to do that. They're going to open up a slew 
of new stores. Is that a good way of using that word, Doug? I like slew. slew. I believe so. All right. A lot, a, a lot of new stores. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. That's what the article said, at least. Let me look it up again. Let me Dang. make sure. You know what, that might be like our world tour. Isn't like, it? We'll just follow What a cool example of what, uh, how different building a business today is to just 20 years ago, right? Like mm-hmm. the, the old model 20 years ago would have been you, you have all these brick and mortars, and then eventually you need to have a website and go online. Yeah. Right. And then mm-hmm. they, they were a direct consumer online and then built the brick and mortar later on. And they're smart because they don't they don't blow them out. They're not massive Macy size type of stores. They're they, they do these small little boutique type stores. It kind of just highlights what all the different styles that they carry. Which and I think fits so well with their brand, right? It does. Yeah, it's totally. smart because what I think most people do is they come in, they want to... Everybody... The one thing about clothes is it is nice to try them on. Like, you I need think, to feel it. You need yeah. to see how it looks. Like You want to get in it to... Because that's... I mean, the magic of Viore is just like it feels so good to wear it. No, it's true. 100%. But uh, so I'm <clears> reading <throat> the article right now that Viore told the San Diego Business Journal... That it uh, its current ad oh so this said that in in 2017 its annual revenue was 10 million, they think that its current annual revenue as of right now is around 28 million. So to get 45 million dollars to expand their stores, that's massive. Yeah, that's a huge success. Oh, that's exciting, man. Yeah, that means that they their investors see a big upswing. Yeah. Um, now here's the challenge with that always is like, do you, do you think sometimes that there's a risk of just going crazy? Not having the, you know, the well, support or whatever. Well, no, I think that before you make this move, it's you, you, you got to lay everything. You got to lay the foundation first. So yeah. I don't think it's that much, that much of a risk now. Mm-hmm. I, you know, we talked. Remember when we interviewed yeah, him? Yeah, they've we, proven the model. Yeah, it's there. And I mean, they, they're 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 moving into a space that already exists, right? It's kind of like what we did. Like it wasn't like there wasn't some a fitness podcast out there. It wasn't like there wasn't trainers that were doing digital programs. They're just they just sucked. Yeah, well, <laughs> Well, there was. There's a huge opportunity that yes. we saw there. And the, the the market was there already. There was already people. I mean, look at Beachbody. I mean, Beachbody's a billion dollar company. Yeah. So if they if So if, if they can do it. Right. No, it's, anybody can do it. So, literally anyone. I mean, you, you gotta think that Viore has to look at they gotta be looking at the market that Lululemon has tapped into. I mean, give me a, a give me a, another company that rivals Lulu. Yeah. It's the athleisure wear market, right? Yeah. It's yeah. blowing up. Yeah, and nobody, nobody else has really competed with them. And I'm, I'm sure there's a few brands out there that are people are like, oh, I really like this brand. And yeah, but nobody, they're not like a household name like Lulu has become. I, dude, Viore blows them all away. I, In my opinion, they do the best job. Well, was it, well, yesterday we were at lunch. It was all of us. So it was me, Justin, Adam, Doug, and Taylor. And as we're walking back from lunch, I, I turn around and look at everybody, and we're all wearing just completely geared head to toe. We're all decked yeah. out. <laughs> we look like a sports team every day now. It's, and I don't even like realize it. You Wait a know? minute, it's just like, man, is this what it's like to be on a sports team? <laughs> kind of sports oh ball. My, yeah, I mean, you're like that guy that you know just wear like never gets dirt on him. You know, like on the field, <laughs> yeah. just hey, like looks pretty. Speaking of our sponsors, did you see Paul Check? Has now on Organifi. Yeah, you know why that's crazy, dude. Paul Check never, never, ever, ever sells supplements. The fact that he partnered with a supplement company actually says a lot. Kind of blew my mind. It says a lot about Organifi because he is uh, he's got the most insane standard when it comes to, to to products and supplements. He's turned down a lot of money. In fact, this is this is a story that I, I can't. 100% confirmed, but I've heard it from people in the know. He's been asked to be on podcasts like the Joe Rogan podcast, but he, because he wouldn't advocate or support the supplements that they sell, they didn't have him come on. Really? Yeah. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's yeah. weird. Because that- he won't sell on it and supplements like that. Mm. You know, I don't know what that's going to look like in the future, but that's the story that I heard. Oh, and I knowing didn't- Paul and knowing of Paul, he's very... His standards are really high. I would love to see him on that show. I I don't think that like he would uh, that, see. That's weird. I don't know like who who said that because like he he does bring up on it quite a bit, but I don't think that he would you know hold that like. Does Joe bring up on it a lot? Not like he does in the beginning, and then like occasionally, but he brings up other products now. I think maybe in the beginning when they're really trying to pitch it, yeah, start I, it going. I felt like they were doing. He did it yeah. a lot. I don't think he does that a lot now. I don't know if it's a recent thing. I think it was right. a while probably ago. a while ago. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a while ago. But it says a lot about Organifi. I mean, it's you, you guys know. I mean, the the vetting process we went through to decide to who we're going to work with. You know, it's weird. I, like immediately, I think about when we had dinner with him, 
and like how like everything was prepared and all this. And then he took that time to kind of like read, you know, what was happening in the food and if it was good for him. <laughs> and all. I wonder was. if he did that. I wonder if he did that with Organifi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, he had that little like weird like prey sesh, you know. No, that's not over what Over the it green was. juice. He was just, he was just no? becoming so... <laughs> <laughs> I know that's how he explained it. Yeah, I can't defend it. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for you yeah. to try right there. Yeah. <laughs> no, but his favorite product is uh, was pure, which makes me feel good. That's the one that I used too, so it's kind of cool. Yeah. What do you, oh, that's what he said on there. That's what he said on there. He likes using pure and the immunity. Those are the ones he likes to. Oh yeah. To, and he adds lime to them. I don't know why. I think he says it activates something in there. I'm gonna try that. Lime? Oh really? Yeah. You know, when Paul says something, you're like, I know. I'm, I'm trying it. On. That's why I started drinking Avion. The no, only, the only uh, thing is the, the. It's right. It is why you drink Avion. It is. It's all you, you got me now. on that, yeah, because he said that was the best water. No, I was, like, I was really, so. really surprised to see. I mean, I, I we have a lot of respect for Organifi, obviously, because we're partnered with them. But I just did not see that coming at all. So that was pretty cool to see that. So you know, it's shout out to Organifi for putting out such a solid product that somebody as picky as Paul would. Uh, do business with them. <laughs> That's the nickname. Yeah. Yeah. Picky yeah. Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Picky <laughs> Uncle Paul. Yeah. Hey, so uh, so Justin, you've mentioned a couple things and then you didn't bring it up because you said you want to talk about the podcast. Oh, yeah. Did we almost lose you? Yeah. I, I, okay, so I was in Tahoe over the weekend. Like We were celebrating our anniversary with the kids and the dog and everybody else. And uh, so we decided to do kind of like this kayaking adventure. And um, there was this new option where we could fit the kids with us and Courtney. And like, so all four of us were like on one, like it was almost like a Tom Sawyer raft. Like it was the weirdest. So it, if you imagine a kayak, which is just like basically like a canoe, uh, but then it had these two pontoon things along the side that it attached to, to with give like more canvas. stability or whatever. Yeah. Like there's a canvas over it. And then we actually even had a sail, which was all like, I was like, who came up with this? And it was all sort of like interlocked. And I just felt like. That sounds like a little Hobie. Yeah. You know what those is? Oh, what? yeah. The little like. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hobie or whatever. Catamaran kind of. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I thought yeah. you said hobo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> isn't that, Doug, isn't that what they're called? Look at a Hobie. Yeah, Hobie cat. Yeah, Hobie cat. You're right. Okay. Uh, I thought. Yeah. I wasn't sure about that. So make, anyway. Might have been one of those ones yeah. I was making up. Wasn't is that, sure. Is that a hobo cat? <laughs> a hobo cat. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like, it was like really funky. You know, it was like like somebody like just decided to, to put all this so it like interlocked together. Or whatever. And you rented it? And we rented it and it was fun. It was like, oh, weird. This is kind of cool. Like everybody's together. We're, we're checking out the coastline, whatever. And uh, I had to pee really bad. And so I'm like, dude, okay, I got to jump and get. And so I stepped on one of the pontoon things and it like snapped its thing off and then it like started to teeter down and like i was like oh no i was in the water and like everybody was kind of sinking in i had to like try and fix it all back together and yeah it was it was like the whole thing almost sank so, so did you was everybody having a life jacket did they all yeah yeah it was okay, fine good. i just it was it was funny because it was just such a a wonky thing dude i thought it was like a legit you know, uh, sail that they that they had put together. Have you guys ever done like whitewater rapids? Have you guys ever done that before? No, no, neither. No. That would be a fun thing for all of us to go. I don't do. think so. Really? Yeah, I disagree. Why? Are you that much of a puss? It's a. Uh, <laughs> it's a. There's a lot of uh, dangers. You have in, a life jacket like on, and like nine other people with you. I don't yeah. know. I don't oh my know god! Are you serious? Yeah, it's are you a that? Bit. Are you that unathletic? Well, look. I tell you what. I tell you what. I'll do. I'll make a deal with you. What? If you allow me to pick, I have to choose. A frightening film. <laughs> you watch that, and I'll, I'll go whitewater rafting with you. I tell you so what, so we could both be brave boys <laughs> together. <laughs> brave boys, <laughs> the brave boys. But I get to pick the film, and Justin, adventure. Trust me, I'll pick a good film, bro. Oh, good. It'll be yeah, good. That's and, fine. But that's it. We watch that, and then we we'll go, and then we'll both be terrified. That's fine. I can do that. I'm down. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. That's, uh, Look how nervous you're getting yeah, right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> That's a good time. Yeah. And then we're no. going to camp. Yeah. No. We're going to chop wood. No, I'm totally down. I've never done it before, but I'm, I'm totally down. I, I've only, I've done the, I kayaked uh, Lake Tahoe, but that's when I got lost. Yeah. Remember when I went all the way across oh, the- Oh, that's right. You did that. Yeah. The lake and uh, got lost there. Is the water, was the water warm this time of year? It was. was it, cold? Really? it wasn't bad. I mean, it was cold, but then it like quickly you, you acclimate and it was like refreshing and it was nice because I mean, the, the weather was like perfect there. It was like 80, 85. You know, the whole weekend. It's so it super nice. Tahoe. A lot of people don't know Tahoe in the summer is freaking amazing. It's really it's nice. It's gorgeous. Thing. But one thing I didn't realize, like, so we rented this this house and this cabin, like, um, no, like, central air. Like, it was there was no oh. AC. And oh. I was like, and we got there and it was like a fucking, it was like super sauna. 
like I was, I was angry and I almost got into it and like I got in trouble because I was like really angry that we didn't have AC and we had to like air it out and all the fans and everything. But then at night it gets cool. So like I was able to deal with it and like, like keep the fans going. But I was like, why would you not have AC? This is crazy. <laughs> it's the anniversary, bro. Yeah. I was yeah. like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like just long trip to get there. And then I'm like, ah. Open the windows. Yeah, I was not being mosquitoes come in. Dude, I've been sleeping bad. on the couch lately because of the the heat in my house, man. It's ridiculous right now. Uh, yeah, like I can't I can't do the angry. I can't I can't do the the seventy three to seventy five and oh because you go all the way downstairs. Yes, where it's cooler. Yeah, it's like a big difference. The difference between my, the very top level and the bottom level is probably I would say ten degrees difference for yeah. sure. What are you gonna do, dude? Because your 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 boy is still young, so it's, it could be it could be years before. Don't say that. You need the cooler. <laughs> don't, don't, don't <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just, don't, say. don't say that. Oh, I, don't, I don't have to sleep oh, with the kid. Oh, rea- I feel like I feel like Katrina and I are fighting or something. You know, like a, <laughs> right? But like I, I tuck yeah. them in bed. It's like I walk over. I grab my two pillows. I kiss Kick her you to, yeah, the, yeah. to the sofa downstairs. Yeah. Good night. I'm going to bed. See you tomorrow. Oh. Yeah. So it's like and like my bottom couch, of course. Like you know, everybody. Well, not everybody, but right, a lot of houses. Everybody has the or most people have the living room and then you have the family room and it's it's the the family room or whatever room you always have one room that's like the stage room that you don't ever really use yeah you can't even walk in it yeah, it well just like for a look right yeah, it's yeah. like the, you it's not where everybody's it's not where the tv's at it's not where people normally congregate at it's the the front room when you first walk in the house and it's always the furniture that looks good and matches everything but it is not that's my house like it's not comfortable so I'm sleeping on that fucking couch. So I'm like really pissed right now that oh. I that I bought a couch like that for that room because for yeah, for the living room, for the, for that room, it fits the look. But man, as far as sleeping on it, oh, it's awful. Yeah. Mm. It's like, Even if you like bundle him really good, I guess because he has to feed, so he's got to kind of come out of the. Yeah, he's constantly coming out of that. And, and it's just it, the air he's breathing in, probably. And it, it's more that, right? It's more actually the what. So, you know, as the uh, as it gets hotter like that, it becomes more humid in there. And when you get when you have an AC running, it dries the air out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's the humidity. It's more the humidity than it is actually the, the cool temperature. Now, you have issues with like allergies and breathing. Is yeah. that something that you think. Oh, God, I hope not. Mm. Yeah, I hope that. That he doesn't have something like that but we are there's something that we're putting together right now like you know we've had a couple times now where he's gotten really fussy and it's always because of him being not able to breathe very well and we take the one of the spare uh, bathrooms the smallest one and crank the shower up hot turn it into a steam room and he will like two minutes in there and he's like so relaxed <gasps> So I know for sure it's him not being able to breathe very well. Do you hear any? You don't oh, hear yeah. any wheezing? Oh, oh yeah, no, you can hear it. Get, get, hit, every once in a while, he'll get kind of raspy and oh, stuff. Oh, so so when I was a kid, um, I was a little bit premature, and I know that they. And I don't know if this is true, but I think the lungs are one of the last things to develop. Mm-hmm. And I had um, asthma when I was little. That's when I started. Now I don't have it as an adult. I outgrew it. But when I was a kid, I had it a little bit, and that's what they used to do to me. My parents used to do the same thing. Oh, really? Yeah, and then they got when then when I would sleep in my own room. Finally, when I would sleep in my crib or whatever, my parents put a um, humidifier. Yes, a humidifier. In the yeah, no, he has. They sleep. He sleeps like le- right next to one with Katrina, and so we have found keeping the house really hot and the humidifier right next to him. He sleeps golden like that, but I'm fucking miserable. Oh, you know, it's man. like yeah. So we're trying to we'll try we're trying to figure it out right now. Like, Dad's not at the top of the totem pole. No, definitely. Yeah, I see that already. Yeah. I'm already came over. I'm on the very <laughs> shitty couch all the way at the bottom of the house right now. Oh, so, man. Yeah, but, so I hope that doesn't last. You're a good it. dad, though. Oh, yeah, do it for dude. your boy. Yeah. One day he'll be listening to this podcast. You hear this, yeah, Max? That's right. Your dad slept on the I'm couch. I'm actually, yeah. so I started it. So I, <clears throat> my uncle, my uncle Casey, you guys know Casey. Uh, you know, a couple. Of th- he's been constantly uh, reaching out to me, and uh, you can tell he's really excited for me and you know, into fatherhood now and stuff. And he has three kids, and they're all grown. They're all in their their twenties and plus. And this is like the third time he's told me this. And my uncle and I like sometimes we clash heads. You guys know that because you know, we work with him and stuff. You're very similar. Yeah, we're very similar because he's, he's you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're very similar, right? In the future, in a different life. And yeah. and uh, you know, I just don't like when people tell me what to do all the time, right? He's definitely he likes to tell me what to do. And it was about the third time he said to me, he says, "Listen, he's like, if there's something that if it, all the things I tell you to do, he's like, the one thing that you'll regret if you don't do it, and I and I regret it today is not having." footage of uh brett or Derek, excuse me his his oldest for the first six months he's like get a camera 
document the process just and just start you know put it in a fucking box don't even worry about it whatever like that but just start taking clips and of him growing up and you'll be so happy you did it and honestly the first time he said it to me and the second time he said it to me i was kind of like yeah 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 you know i did kind of one of those but inside i'm going like you know my whole life is fucking documented right now i'm so over the cameras the audio like i mean that's like our life and so right now i i kind of have this you know i'm very private with him and you know katrina and our family right now it's kind of like that's for me you know i'm saying it's not for the whole world and so there's a part of me that was like, kind of like, ah, I don't, you know, I'm not going to go rush to go do that. I'll, I'll worry about that when it gets to big milestones. And then I got to thinking about it <clears throat> and it actually got me kind of emotional because, you know, my father passed when I was seven years old and, you know, as I'm, I'm getting older now, right. And the memories are, are, are fading for sure. I mean, trying to, I, you, if you would ask me when I was a teenager, do I remember my father? I'd be like, oh yeah, I totally remember my father. And I'd have actually specific memories that I could probably recall now, as time has gone by, those have gotten, you know, I've gotten to the point where there's very few that I remember, mm-hmm. and I really don't have much footage. I mean, I think I have two Christmas videos uh, with my dad in it and myself and my sister. I think I have one or two soccer games that I played when I was little with little tiny clips of him in it, but nothing really. I mean, that's it. A little bit of footage. And I started thinking about that, like, man, where I'm at in my life right now, I would uh, over watching some stupid Netflix show or anything. I would love to sit down and just watch clips of my dad with me at one and two and three and four years old and five years old. And it really got me thinking. I thought, man, you know what? Like this isn't about me, you know, and, and, and what I want to do and what I, what I think I want to be video or not. It's like, this is something, this is for him. And so immediately I got on Amazon and and shot over a, a set. So literally today, I'm going to start documenting uh, everything and just start, you know, separating it by the month or whatever and put it to the side and I'll worry about, you know, pay someone to edit it up one day and clip it all up or whatever, but at least to have it there and have it cataloged. So if I ever want to go back and refer to it or if he ever wants to watch it totally 20 mm-hmm. years later. It's I've funny you bring that up. It was uh, just this last weekend uh, when I saw my, my parents, my dad has old VHS of us as kids and so he pulled them out and hooked up his old camera and plugged it into the tv and hit play and there we were you know there i was 12 years old you know it's funny too watching these videos of myself at 12 you know what i'm doing to the camera like every three minutes flexing (laughs) i'm flat i'm 12 you know what i mean so already i'm like wow it was it was early on i could see that this is something i was interested but it's cool you know see my brothers and sisters and you know what's cool about, uh, you know, because back when those films were being made of us, I was, it was in the uh, 80s and, and 90s, the cameras had sound too. So it's cool to hear the voices because yeah. that's something that pictures don't capture. Oh, that's so, weird to listen to yourself. Like, isn't it? When you're a little kid with the high voice and all the high pitch. It's funny because like I was watching, the, and my parents, they have like a bunch of footage like that, just random stuff. And there was one when I was in, in preschool with one of my friends and you see me just like putting wigs on and like glasses and all this like silly shit and like doing all this like weird stuff. And I'm like, oh, I still do that. Yeah. Is that cool? Look at that. You know, yeah, <laughs> like, that's so see, cool. See what's going on now. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, did you guys all re- we all read that, uh, fitness article on boutique fitness. Did you guys all take a look at that? Oh, the one that Doug sent over. Yeah. I actually didn't read that. I was, but I've been in the middle of actually talking to people about this for a while. We've talked about this is, we've all, We've all observed this over the last, uh, I'd say probably 10 years I've seen this kind of growth in the fitness space, and it's been largely these smaller boutique type fitness studios. Well, it's another um, It's another thing that I actually attribute a lot of it to CrossFit. Um, I mean, it, even though- I think was, they're a part of it. I would consider oh, them part of that. Yeah, no, I think they're a, a, a major reason for it. I think they did such a good job- of it becoming so popular, and what's happened, which is typical uh, with things like things like this, is you know there's probably a lot of people that did CrossFit for quite some time and were kind of over it, mm-hmm. but they but there's a lot of parts about it they really liked, and so other companies are are really smart and they're capital. The one what I would say one of the best things they did aside from <clears throat> you know we've complimented them on getting people back into deadlifting and squatting and some of these barbell complex movements that were so important to training. I think they did that incredibly well. But most importantly, they built these small communities. Yeah. 
They did, and they did a really good job of that of that feel. And I tell you what, you know, most people that are uh, that are so dogmatic about it, they don't even realize it's it's not the the exercise programming that they're dogma. It's about mm. the, the the culture and the community that they did a good job of building. Absolutely, and it's it's interesting because like think about after school and like you know where you would go in, in order to get that same kind of experience. It's either like you know church or if you're like going into your local community and trying to help out with whatever you know activities that the community is putting on. Like there's really not a lot of really tight communities like that that you could be a part of anymore and so them capturing that and showing like hey we could everybody could meet here together and, and it's like small enough to where you actually remember people's names and it's not you're not just scanning your card and doing your own thing like we have enough of we're doing our own thing yeah it's definitely the community aspect i don't i mean yes crossfit was a part of it but there was there, it was there was other sides too that i don't think had anything to do with crossfit like yoga studios those really started to explode <clears throat> pilates studios those started to explode Personal training studios, even those started to explode. You started to see just fitness being approached from a different angle aside from the big globo fitness gyms because the 90s really saw the explosion of, uh, you know, the 24 hour fitnesses, yeah. the gold gym, LA that type fitness, of thing. All that. LA fitness, that started to, and it continued to grow in the early 2000s. But as that started to kind of plateau a little bit in terms of its, its speed of growth, you saw these small boutiques kind of explode mm -hmm. and they're everywhere. And, and that's what this article said. This article said that, that the fitness industry grew a lot uh, last year, but the vast majority of the growth uh, is attributed to these boutique fitness uh, gyms like soul cycle, orange theory mm -hmm. and others. Orange theory is a great example. They went from nothing to a thousand locations in like no time at all. It was like a five year period where, where they just exploded. So it's interesting to see all this. I think it's going to keep going that way. I think as fitness becomes more mainstream, mm -hmm. it's going to become more um, personalized. It's going to become more personalized. Like fitness grew and it became it was very general. Yeah. So like you go to a 24-hour fitness, it's kind of a general gym. You have weights, you have machines, cardio, a pool, basketball. But then as – and this happens to all markets. As they become more and more popular and mainstream, it stops becoming so general and it becomes much more – personalized. So now instead of going to a gym that's got all that stuff, maybe you go to a hardcore lifting gym and it's like 5,000 square feet. Or maybe you go to a, a, a facility that just does group type exercise. Or maybe you just go to a water type facility, which I haven't seen yet, but I would assume that would probably pop up as well. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to keep going in that direction. I think the names will change though. I don't think it's going to always be I agree. Orange I, Theory or, you know. No, I agree yeah. with you. This is why I'm actually, I'm interested in a company right now that's doing something where, because what it, the problem with that is this, is that once, you, once you've kind of been doing something like that for a long period of time, and we talk about this on the show, the importance of moving in and out of different modalities. Right, because eventually the body gets adapted to whatever. If you love your cycle bar, you love your yoga. You love. Initially, you get all these great results. When you're talking about changing the body, right, losing mm -hmm. body fat or building muscle, you know, not just staying healthy. Or right? you could do one of those modalities for the rest of your life and and get some healthy health benefits. Yeah, it's better from, than nothing, right? Better than right. nothing, right? But if you want to keep changing the body and progressing, there's a lot of value in moving in and out of all these different modalities. So the problem with a lot of these boutique gyms is they cater to a niche. Right. right, like oh, that's it's their weakness. Their strength is their right. weakness. Now, I do see some companies out there that are doing this, which I think are brilliant. Which is having like a parent company that has a bunch of these different boutiques underneath it, and then you could have access to all of that. To me, is smart. So well, if you, you know, Mastroff's smart. company did that. Uh, what, what's the company that Mastroff owns? That is the parent company of all the clubs that he owns. Like he owns he has, UFC gyms. He's got some Crunch Fitness. He's got Madonna's Hard Candy. Some those Steve Nash gym. He's got a bunch of. But he also has Yoga Works under him and a couple other small boutique facilities. And now he's he, at, he owned them for a while. Now he doesn't offer though like a Golden Pass, does he? Because to me, oh, that, that's a good question. Because that know. that to me is the that's what I see with the, the, one of the companies that I'm looking at right now that I think is really smart is, you know, they have this opportunity. Like so, my, imagine right, you have a, they have like a stretch, they have a stretching like boutique place, they've got like a rowing boutique place, and they have kind of like an Orange Theory type of field place. You know, so you have these different type of modalities and they all are standalone by themselves. So if you're somebody that's just into rowing, like to your point, Sal, you can just go there all the time. But you, if you're somebody who sees the value in doing stretching and also doing strength training and these other ones, you could pay a higher fee that allows you access to all of them so you can bounce around that's to them. That's so smart. So are, is he or whoever is, you know, behind this company, are they like 
scouting out areas and like planting all of those different like uh, different experiences within like a like a proximity of a so couple miles or the, the idea is that would be that would be a smart strategy for it's a, it's a franchise Mm-hmm. Right, so it's, so, it's not as centralized as that, right? Yeah, it's okay. not. It's, yeah, it's not as centralized as if it was a privately owned company. Then that you would do that. You would drop in. Boom! I'm going to drop. You'd this. have all the things, right? Because if you had like a strip mall and you had like all those options, it'd be kind of crazy. Like you could go bounce one to the other. Still, though, what a brilliant idea! It is, it is brilliant. Yeah, yeah, think about the retention you could you could create that way. You know, someone's coming to your place and they've come for a year and they're kind of bored of it. Yeah. Hey, you know, down the street is. A different type of workout that we also, uh, you know, can give you access to. Yeah. So now you can do all those things. Yeah. And from a fitness professional standpoint, I think there's a lot of integrity in that, obviously, because you're keeping people. From- That's the only way I yeah. could. I could. I could get. I mean, you've heard me on this show many times talk about <laughs> thinking that group training should die, and I know I offend <laughs> everybody, right? Since it's, yeah. here we are talking about how it's blowing up. So <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I know everybody hates when I say that because I'm taking like a direct shot at probably fucking 50 percent of the people that listen to this show and that, their livelihood, but. I, it's for that reason, right? Because I know that it's not ideal for somebody, but I do like this, and I do think that's a that's a clever way to address that. The, my concern, my concern is uh, the the mobility issue. So I really think there's a huge opportunity for that space is doing uh, some sort of mobility type of work because there's not enough of that to mm-hmm. complement the CrossFits, to complement the Orange Theories. And then if you have different modalities, like maybe one is geared towards running, one's geared towards rowing, one's geared towards strength training and 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 working out like that, and then you have one that's mobility. And if you had a, co- a parent company that had all of those umbrella, it, that would be brilliant. And then you offer either in the, you can go up to just one, or you can have access to all of them. I think that's a really really smart model. Yeah, I wonder how they would they would how they would compensate the facilities with a golden pass. You know what I'm saying? All oh, right. Like let's say how there's they, yeah, split that up. Yeah, like let's say there's 300 locations under this umbrella company that you could buy a pass to and go to all of them. How do they each get a piece, especially if they're a franchise? Like if I own this location over here and you have a golden pass and you're well orange theory's already figured this out because orange theory allows so let's do they say do that? well yeah they, they they've already i don't know how i forget how this works or how they figure the math out but okay it looks like this like so they have access to and i believe the software does this like you can see who's checking it because it's small small enough and boutique enough that only 30 30 to 50 people are taking these classes they have to check in and, and that's all done on the computer so if you have a membership and you pay you know, hundred and some, hundred and say fifty dollars a month. That's divided by all your visits. But if you do a visit over at somebody else's franchise, but you have access to it, that money goes to them. Oh, so it's based off of the club that they use. Yes. Now, what if they don't use the club? Then it just goes all to the to the club that they signed so, up at. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Uh, well, that's see, that's smart. It's fair. Like you're going to get credit for signing them up in the first place, right. and then of course you get credit for getting them to use your facility. Right. But I could also see like an aggressive <laughs> an aggressive gym owner like, you know, like 20-year-old Sal. <laughs> right. You know, not only would I be pulling people from my competitors, but I'd be like, you know, that <laughs> friendly the, fire. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, hey, have you tried our workout classes? Come try this. Well, yeah, that's cool, but it's way cooler here. Well, what's crazy is that, I mean, these things are, I, it, there's over a thousand orange theories that exist right now. And do you know that a hundred percent of them are profitable? That's crazy. That's so I, I've crazy. never, I can't even, I it, almost don't believe it. I know. know. Yeah, that's basically like the McDonald's, right? That's that's what happened. It's insane that, and so there's no, there isn't that competition. Yeah, like you don't even care. Like more orange theories. Like it was so funny. I remember when I first was doing it with Brendan and watching them pop up. Like a new one would come down the street, and there was no threat. It was like, oh, good, we have some relief because we have a waiting list for all of our classes. Oh, wow. wow. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, oh, now at least we can serve some of these people, can go over, we can tell them they can go over there. So, I mean, most of the classes were, I mean, when I was there back when it first started, and I'm sure it would, I would assume it's worse as far as getting in, I always, every single class I taught, there was a 10 person waiting list. And most people, once they see the 10 person waiting list, they don't even sign up for it because they already know, they know the likely, because you sign up like hoping you get in the class. If there's a 10 person waiting list, you still sign up because you hope that 10 people fall off. But after 10, nobody signs up because it's just like, mm. I'm, I'm not going to, because they don't want to waste they're it. they're not going to make it. Yeah, they're not going to make it. So they don't even waste their time signing up for that. So that's how booked the classes were. And that would be booked out for me for at least a week or two in advance. Is it starting to level out now? Yeah. I mean, I think the, I think the US market for Orange Theory has peaked. Really? I think, yeah, yeah. No, if you're, if you're a person trying to get into the space now, um, it is, I think it's getting competitive enough. I think there's other boutiques that are coming in. I mean, we're, we're watching it happen in San Jose. I think you, 
they're they're popping up all over the place, and then there's other ones that are similar to it that are popping up around it. God, so. fitness is such a fad driven business, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's oh, yeah. it's like a it's such a it's like fashion. It's like it's like you know these this cool shirt or whatever this new look, right? And you're gonna make a shit ton of money, but in five years it's totally out of well, style because they attract all the people that want the experience. You know, like yeah. I, I want it to you know feel this way, and I like what happens here. And it it all highlights that. the pro- the issue, which is that we are we're catering to the whole motivation inspirational. Well, that's aspect. Totally, and that's totally. the thing that I have the problem with. I mean, that's that's why I don't like it. I don't like it because it's the low hanging fruit because it makes it doesn't really. It doesn't help as many people as we make it sound like it does. Mm-hmm. You just keep catering to the to the aspect that is what makes people inconsistent in the first place, yeah. which is you need to come into a place that makes you feel inspired and motivated and hyped and excited to work out, and that is not a long-term approach. Nobody is ever excited, hyped uh, all the time to yeah. work out. It just, doesn't, it just doesn't happen that way. Even the most dedicated fitness people – Aren't like that every workout. It turns. It's more of a of a lifestyle than it is that aspect of it. I mean, all my workouts. Some of them I am excited and hyped, and some of them I just do. Um, it's not drudgery, but I just do them. Well, we talked about that in the last one of the last quads we did. That you know, I forget what the question exactly. Well, was. what separates people who are consistent? Yes, versus those that, yeah. yeah, and that really address. And we all said basically the sim- same thing that we figured out as trainers, and it took years before I pieced this together. Then that was once I stopped trying to be the cheerleader trainer and the hype and the motivation and the creative workouts because that was a good portion of my my training career was that was yep. that that's how I got clients to resign that's how mm-hmm. I got people enticed to come to me once I figured out that that was just this vicious cycle and that I was better off by not even worrying about any of that bullshit and then helping my clients attach what their workout did to all the other things of their life the things that nobody talks about no because it's not sexy to sell Mm -hmm. like nobody's advertising like hey come work out here and your shits will be better hey come work (laughs) out here and your sleep will be better hey come work out here and your relationship with your that sounds good yeah but less anxious less depressed yeah right but the reality is that when you train properly and what give the body what it needs workout which sometimes isn't a you know, loud ass music and fucking running on a treadmill or rowing your ass off. Sometimes it isn't that. Sometimes it's a therapeutic, therapeutic type of mobility, yoga type of workout. And then sometimes it is balls to the wall, heavy lifting, training. Whatever. But the, the reality is once you learn how to do that for where you're at in your, your current week or your current life, and you learn to, to do that correctly, and then you learn to attach those other things to it like oh wow when i listen to my body and i train it accordingly this feels better this feels better this is better this is better that has nothing to do with what i look like in the mirror nothing to look like on the or what's going on on the scale and over time it just becomes automatic yeah it's just like brushing your teeth like we don't have to be hyped to brush our teeth and take a shower every morning you know what i'm saying right you don't need to be hyped to work out all the time maybe you do if to get started But if you rely on that, Especially you're fucked. Especially cold showers. Yeah, and all mm. these, all these, and that's what the fitness space does. Is it? Is it? Is it caters to that? Like, okay, let's catch them all through the hype because then they spend lots of money and they're here, and then you can't. But you can't keep them. It's like you know what it's like. Mm. It's like a, uh, it's like a bucket with holes in it. You know, all, that's that's what they do. They get to get a lot of water, but the water keeps coming out, and eventually you lose all the water, and, and that's why it's so fad based. Yeah. You know, I remember when uh, curves exploded it went at it it was the fastest growing fitness chain ever they're gone do they even exist anymore right you know what i'm saying they went from that to that it's yeah. crazy, it's crazy. I, that's another thing that i think that that's a great point because it's another thing that we mistake is just because something is incredibly successful in the fitness space we assume that it's good or it's right no right. if we're going to base it off of standard yep but. if we're going to base it off of historical you know what's happened historically then we can. It's far more likely that this is a fad. Yeah, there's a shelf life, and that this will end. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Right. Far more likely. Speaking of hype, dude, uh, Keanu is <laughs> like so that. hot right now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this guy's on a tear, dude. Can you? Yeah, can you? Bill and Ted's what? What? Well, not Bill and Ted, dude. Matrix Four. Whoa. Oh, they just confirmed that uh, the I script's I... written. Oh, really? And uh, basically, like, it got the one of the Wachowski, which basically is uh, the Wachowski sisters now. I don't know if you knew that. Or what the not. hell? I thought they were. Did they transform? They or tran- yeah, they did. They transitioned. Transformed. Yeah. Well, same both. Thing. Yeah, whatever. But yeah. Um, yeah. So that, and they also got Trinity, the, 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 the actress that played Trinity. She's signed on too. So it's looking like it's got real promise. What? Yes. Well, okay. So remind me, it wasn't part three 
where it ended that there was like a truce between the humans and the machines. I feel that's what happened. Because I, he I went don't in, even remember. If I, if I recall correctly, uh, Neo... I thought he died, but no, he came... He, he, blind, he was blinded. He was blinded. Yeah, Neo agreed to go into the Matrix to kill uh, the virus that was Agent Smith. Right. And yes. then and the truce they was, it. I'll go in there, I'll destroy him, and yeah. then you leave us alone. Yeah, our we'll colony uh, is going to stay the same, and then you guys can have yeah whatever. That's how it ended, right? Yeah. Wow. And yeah. so now they have... So oh, now where do you go from that? Oh, there's know. an official trailer, Doug? Are you going to play the trailer for us? I'm trying, yes. So. I didn't know there was a trailer. I, there, yeah, I, I don't think it's a me. trailer. I think it's just a like a hype reel. Oh, forget uh, that. No, that's yeah. yeah. I think that's just I hate recapping they, old clips. I hate it when they come out with fake trailers. Yeah. I get all excited. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> dude, every, you did, remember when you were fucking with Justin with all the Star Wars ones? You did Star Wars, and I'm like, <laughs> dude, this is all rehashed shit. This is uh, not new. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, I was so angry. You guys know that the original Matrix came out something like twenty something years ago, right? Yeah. Is it that long? Yes. Oh my god. Well, yes. Like, oh. It's like you know who's going to be extra excited about this? Tom Bilyeu. Oh yeah. Oh right. yeah. I totally forgot about that. I guess you actually, know Tom I bet actually he knows what me this... yesterday about. By you the way, Doug, our, our comics are on their way. Oh good. Oh sweet. Yeah. yeah, he was asking like if he wanted to like autograph to us personally or me individually or what. So I just told him to, to group it like all of us. It's all I said, we'll probably keep it in the studio somewhere and framed up for you because we're so proud of you. Yeah, I, I got I was like, I wonder if Tom's behind this. You know stupid. <laughs> How <laughs> sick would that be though? He talked about trying to get you know rights to Dude, it. the Matrix, the original one, because two and three were they were good, but they were not anywhere near as awesome as the first one. Oh, the first one was so groundbreaking. And do you guys remember when it came out? At first, it got no publicity. It hit the theater, and it wasn't like that big of a deal. But then people were watching it, and they were like... No, because remember, the campaign was, what is the Matrix? Yeah. You know, and so it was just this weird, like, everybody's like, what are you talking about? You're like, what, what are we doing here? Uh -huh. And then it, like, revealed itself in the movie. I thought it was brilliant, though, because it got your... You're like, what is this thing? Has Why to be. Yeah. It's one of the most groundbreaking movies ever, especially the way it was shot with the... the and it got... The played fight out scenes yeah uh, that part insane. got played out the, yeah. where the camera would rotate around a frozen you know like yeah but they were the first ones to do that they were yeah. the first ones to do it yeah. yeah i know they did some cool shit in there for sure oh, i love god it. 20 years it's more <sighs> i think it's like 20 something. remember enzo didn't even know what we were talking about you know <laughs> we're like mm -hmm. a matrix like what what's that yeah i know broke my heart how dare you that's crazy you guys see uh apple uh apple plus the tv they i think they they moved to at six billion dollars that they're uh investing in original and original content that's like the war right now right so the big thing right now six billion yeah wow. between apple netflix who all these ones that we've been talking about streaming services it's crazy, dude. We are we we talked about this a couple of years ago that we you know when we were doing the whole hollywood speculation and that it's going to die. I mean, what you're seeing now is and this is it's going to be really interesting where movies move to in the in the future because these streaming services are going out and they're paying top dollar for some of the biggest names. Yeah. And like I don't know, you guys watched you guys watched Kevin Bacon's uh thing on um Showtime? Mm -mm. Oh man, that's uh God, Doug, look at you. What isn't Kevin Bacon doing? He's he's got a great he's, he's got a great one right now that I'm, I'm into, and it's on it's on the se it just started the second season, I believe, or we're we're towards the end of the first. I can't remember where we're at in it, but I really really like it. City on a Hill. Yes, City, okay. City on the Hill is really good. But anyways, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of these streaming services are starting to pay actors that would normally only be on the big screen, right? Mm -hmm. That we would ne you would never see a big name actor on television. Just a decade or no, two there, ago. No, it was like a, that would be like a death sentence. Right. It, yeah, they would consider that you are a B list or a C list actor if you're still on basic cable or TV. You would never do something like that. But that model is being flipped on its head. Yep. You're starting to see big name actors are on shows. Te yeah. w w w w this is like TV shows, right? What I what to me, streaming is no different than you know, like cable was just because the tide's turning. That's why. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you so know, there, there's investing six billion dollars this year in original content. Th that where that m that money goes is that they're paying, you know, big time actors and, and actresses, writers, directors, writers and, yeah, yeah big everybody. money to write, write and, and act out these these Ima new original content. Imagine like an Apple TV or Netflix Spielberg, you know, movie oh, just yeah. for them. That, that that's coming. Epic. It's totally coming. What's going to happen, and, and this is kind of to 
you know, this would be agreeing with you, Sal, and and submitted to you being right in this. Although I still want to, I still want to argue with you about it. Wow. That hold on a second. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you smell the let air. Me breathe, let me breathe yeah, that yeah. in. For some... <laughs> All the fumes that came out of your mouth. Like, I, I mean, I still believe that Netflix is going to get taken down at one point, and I know that sounds crazy to the, all the people that are on you know, Camp Netflix. Uh, because I just I have I have more confidence in Apple and HBO and Showtime sure. and, and Disney. Like I just think they're better companies um, in general, and they've got way more uh, longevity. But you, who knows if you are right? The way it's going to look and the way it's shaping up is we may have this a la carte. You know, instead of like a you know you'll have the ability if you want to you know pay twelve ninety nine for. You know, Disney's Plus, you can pay twelve ninety nine for Netflix, you can pay twelve ninety nine for HBO or you know, it's you know, I got a show on Showtime I love and I can watch the whole season for ninety nine cents. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And and just a la carte everything. We might be moving there. You I know, think so. That I might think, that you know that that might be what the future looks like as things get more and more competitive. That's just what the consumers demand because there may be a show on HBO that you just freaking love. But you're not, and that's really all you're interested in for yeah, HBO, or now, or you know, and and it that's just the way it's shaping up. I think all the, the all markets are going to look like now. That. The reason why I, I still want to argue with that, and why I, what I think that I can make a case for what might happen, and again, why I was betting on the big the big horses, is because if you're you're big enough and bad enough, you buy out all these actors and actresses, mm -hmm. and you and you you cock block Netflix or somebody else from doing that. Now Netflix was. I think the first to, to invest billions into oh, original. Oh, you want to put it eloquently that way, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean uh, the visuals there, original content. But now everybody's getting on board. So what happens when you tie up? If you've got the capital to tie up, you know, ten or twenty of the A-list actors and actresses that are out there, mm -hmm. and so they're now doing content just for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody could strong arm somebody else. Right now, they're all kind of. You know, using different actors and actresses, but whoever starts to get the lead on this or has the well, the look at music. Yeah. Uh, music is what's going to happen to TV. If you look at music, yeah. how many people buy an album? Right. You know, we buy one song at a time, and you have Apple, you know, music. You have Spotify and Pandora, and all these competitors. Uh, I think it's going to look like that for everything because it's all tech. It's well, all, you know, I, I wonder I, about that because with with the streaming kind of interrupted that whole thing where you're just buying like one song and all that. It's it's basically like how many listens are you getting current like in comparison to other albums that are out there, and so you get paid more from all these people that are listening at the same time. Well, mm -hmm. see, I believe when you talk about things like Spotify too, I just think we're we're in a we're in the middle of the changing of the the guard. Totally. So I don't I don't I I still think that even though there's iHeartRadio, there's Spotify, there's iTunes, th they're all competing right now. But I think the one will emerge. Mm. I think 10, 20 years when our kids are all grown, there's not going to be ten different music streaming services, yeah. ten different movie streaming services. I think somebody will emerge Here, from all that and look, dominate. Here's why I, I, I disagree with that. Uh, unless there's regulations that are put forth, which may happen, you may get a big dog with a lot of money that goes to Congress and passes some regulation for our quote unquote safety. It makes it impossible <laughs> I know. to enter the market. But if that doesn't happen and it stays open, look, how many shoe manufacturers are there? Did one emerge as the as the guy that makes all the shoes or food or clothes or cars or anything else? It doesn't it doesn't work that way. I think we're gonna have and the more open the market is, the more options we're gonna have. So like the auto industry is extremely regulated. That's why we only have, you know, six or seven, I don't know how many major car manufacturers. But if it was super unregulated, you would have so many different varieties. If it contain if it stays the way it I just is, feel like we're just it, gonna have so much variety. I feel like it will get regulated because you're talking about people you're talking about actors and actresses and you're talking about you're talking about uh, musicians and stuff that and that was one of the problems with Napster when it first came out. At one point they're gonna unionize or band together and be like, hey, we're getting fucked. You know, you know that's gonna happen, right? Because you're you're gonna we, it's getting better for consumers for us for sure. Like the, the price now, I mean, it, to me, it, it blows my mind that for nine dollars a month with Spotify, I have access to all the music I could ever want. Well, yeah. you, that's the, rad. Well, that's bro. what I'm saying. Use okay. You look at the music industry. The music industry. But it, that's, not, that's not good for the musicians, well, though. Well, it's, it, it doesn't matter who's mm -hmm. it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. That's not the point. Like the point is, the music industry was one of the is is but was for sure one of the most powerful industries in the world. 
It just was. It generated tremendous amounts of money and had a lot of influence uh, in the world. And they couldn't stop it. They couldn't stop it. And so I think as technology continues to improve, we're getting to the point where sharing movies for free is going to be like it was sharing music. Yeah. It, so it, they're gonna, the only way they're going to be able to fight with that is by making it super convenient, clean, and easy, and you're going to have tons and tons of writing. This is what markets do, and you're right. It's worse for the musicians. It's worse for the actors and actresses, but it's better for the consumer. I know, but that's why. Why is Comcast still the top dog? Oh, well, they won't be. They, because I Come on. Like, where, where is everybody? Because you don't have any options, and that's yeah. exactly uh, – and that has to do more regulation than it does oh, with the market. Oh, man, that pisses Absolutely. me off. Well, you know, that's what you don't think. You don't think that the – I feel like because it, it, it will eventually start to dip into the pockets – of the rich and famous, that if there's anybody that's going to band together too to, late. to create regulation. I think I think you're right, but it's too late. The cat's out of the bag. So like with Comcast, those regulations were put in place way before. Way before everything. Yeah, yeah, and so we're dealing with this archaic. Now, once they figure out a way to go around it, yeah. uh, which How they're starting- lift all those? Well, they're starting to figure out ways to go around it where everything's going to be streaming. You're not going to need cable for shit. Oh, you're so gonna, like the cloud-based everything. Everything, yeah. I see. But, but, but it's been slow because of those regulations. Mm. The cat's out of the bag, so it's kind of difficult. It's impossible to go through. And they'd have to go through and do some really sweeping, crazy internet regulations, which could happen. I'm not saying it won't happen. They, they've, they've surprised me before. But that's going to be hard, man. Yeah, when's when's Apple or Amazon going to come up or Google going to come up with an internet service? Right. You know what I'm saying? That's like- I heard like, about Google Wire and that was like a thing like maybe 10 years ago and I never saw any progress in that direction. Yeah, so we'll I've see. just been like, ah, oh, I've been- Because it's like what at t has like- and, and that doesn't even like reach my neck of the woods. So yeah. it's like I don't even have like another option. No, that's all archaic laws it's and stuff. Yeah. Held hostage. <laughs> By Maps Anabolic. If you're looking to maximize your overall muscle and strength, Maps Anabolic is the perfect place to start. With a full 30 day money back guarantee, there is absolutely zero risk. So, what are you waiting for? Go to mindpumpmedia.com and get started today. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quiqua. All right, our first question is from Brandon Pew Pew987. Pew Pew Pew. <laughs> Do you get the same benefits or gains from conventional deadlifts and sumo deadlifts? And the same question for high bar squats and low bar squats. Okay. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. they're different exercises. Yeah. You get similar benefits similar. and similar gains, but no. They're recruitment patterns. No, they're different exercises. Well, and the, the truth is this, is that you'll get the most gains from the one that you haven't been doing the most. Mm -hmm. This is the, the same rule applies. If you're somebody who always conventional deadlifts and you're very consistent with that, and you rarely ever or never sumo deadlift. I mean, I went through a phase of uh, sumo deadlifting for a while, and I'm terrible at it. And th that's the reason why I started doing it was because I was like, I got, I'm really good at conventional deadlifting. I've done this, yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, and man, I tell you what, the the leading month after the month after that, all kinds of gains came oh, on. Yeah. So. You know, and the same thing goes for high bar, low bar squats. I was going to ask, have you done that much? Because I've I've done that probably more than the sumo. And the difference between the high bar and the, and the low bar position with the squat was pretty interesting. Right? So I couldn't do a high bar, a really good high bar squat until just recently. So it took me a lot. Takes way more mobility. Yeah, that way, takes, yeah, yeah in mobility. order to be able to sit upright, mm -hmm. um, and so you have to have a lot better thoracic mobility um, mm -hmm. in order to do that, and ankle mobility to get in deep squat. So I'm just now actually doing a lot more high bar squatting. When I when I first was progressing my squat and getting better at it and working on my mobility, I actually was kind of handcuffed to doing low bar squats mm -hmm. because I needed that I needed to shorten the lever yeah. uh, when I squatted in order because my Did mobility your forward lean like you had a propensity to yeah. more towards a forward lean totally. Yeah. But yeah. now I mean I'm there. I, I so I actually mess with a and I and I just kind of bounce back and forth like if I know that I've been. Squatting more uh, on a high bar, then I'll switch down to low bar. But I absolutely yeah. feel a difference. You know where this comes from, right? What? This 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 uh, question comes from the confusion that powerlifting has brought um, training, and and I'm not saying powerlifting's bad uh, at all. Uh, but in powerlifting, when you compete in a deadlift, it doesn't matter if you sumo or conventional deadlift. They'll mm -hmm. let either the, both of them uh, both of them Your are considered yeah. a deadlift. It's just how much weight you can lift. Those are the two accepted 
forms of a deadlift. Same thing with the squat. doesn't matter how you squat so long as you break parallel um, and the bar is on your back in some way. Mm -hmm. um, if you squat all the way down, come back up. doesn't matter if it's high bar or low bar squat. So a lot of this is from, is from the powerlifting uh, space. Now with powerlifting, you got to understand the goal is to move the most amount of weight within their structure of what your form should look like. And they're loose in the sense that you can pick from a few different styles. Now there is there are parameters like the, with a with a deadlift, you have to take the bar off the ground and be at a full uh, lockout, and you have to support the weight, and then you have to put it down without dropping the weight, and that's it. Um, other than that, so long as you conventional or sumo, they don't give a shit. They don't. It doesn't matter. So that's where it came from. Like it doesn't matter whichever one you do; they're both considered a deadlift. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is, the truth is, although they're similar in the sense that you're using a lot of the posterior chain, those are all the muscles of the back, they're totally different exercises. They really, really are. I mean, a sumo deadlift is a very different exercise from a conventional deadlift. Now, a low bar and a high bar squat, they're more similar, but they're still different exercises. The placement of the weight changes the length of the lever. Yeah, one needs more shoulder mobility than the other. Like, yeah, more more vertical position, more thoracic mobility. So, yeah, there's there's considerations, especially if you're, you know, limited a bit. One, you might have a preference, you know, towards one or the other. Like for me, I love. Uh, I was in the same position where, uh, you know, I'd have a little bit of a forward lean, so I like the low bar position. I prefer that, uh, you know, more. But that's why I wanted to work a little bit more in my high bar position because yeah. I knew that was different. Yeah, and Olympic lifters, they like to do the high bar squat and some of them are really good at it but if you watch an olympic lifter squat 600 or 700 pounds and i've seen them it looks different than a power lifter squat they're they're way more upright they go mm. down fast yeah. <laughs> way yeah. in comparison oh, they go down fast makes me nervous on the knees they, as they bounce up they, so quick yeah it's because they're, they're it's a speed uh, you know power type movement or power lifting is more oh, that kind of i mean olympic strength. lifters mobility is so much better than oh, a yeah. power lifters oh it's incredible we know Super i know dynamic. a lot of really successful power lifters that have shit mobility you can get away. You can get away with kind of poor mobility and still be a strong as fuck power lifter. Yeah. Uh, try being an Olympic lifter with poor mobility. Well, it ain't yeah. gonna happen. It's yeah. that fast loose. Like, yeah. You have to have both. Right. And, and, and the techniques and the form just require so much mobility. Now, as far as like results on your body, okay, conventional deadlifts they're gonna hit your lower back a little bit harder um, than a sumo deadlift. Um, you're still gonna get a lot of glute and hamstring work. Sumo deadlift. You get more hip involvement, more glute involvement, um, a little bit less of that lower back work. People who tend to benefit um, from, well, I shouldn't say benefit, people who tend to, tend to be better at a sumo deadlift tend to be shorter. Right. So shorter, smaller uh, lifters and women tend to perform better at the sumo deadlift. People with longer arms, longer legs, like you look at a guy like Adam, he's going to do a lot better with a conventional deadlift. I do better with a conventional deadlift, although I learned how to deadlift uh, sumo style. When it comes to high bar or low bar squats, um, high bar, you're going to get more quad involvement. There's a little bit more knee extension, um, a little bit more hip involvement. Um, a low bar squat, you're going to get more, more hip involvement, a little bit more back involvement with a lift. And if you're going to just lift maximal weight, most people will do better with a low bar squat, but this isn't true for everybody. You mm -hmm. got to kind of find what works best for you. If you're looking for maximal weight, other than that, you know, what we always communicate is true here. If you're looking for overall, you know, good development, good performance, muscle, fat loss, all that stuff, I think you should practice all of them. Now, here's the best way to do it. Get good at one. Once you feel comfortable and good at one, then move into the other one and try getting good at that one. Right. I don't think it's a good idea to just switch all the time. No, no, no. Unless you're really good at both of them. You know what I mean? No, you want to get, you want to make a run at one of these for uh, quite some time. Yes. We've already talked about how difficult uh, squatting and deadlifting is, and you could spend your whole life trying to perfect that and never get a perfect squat or a deadlift. So you would definitely want to focus on one for a while. Yeah. But I just think it's, you know, pay attention. If you've been... Doing one of these for you know six months consistently or longer, and you you haven't sumo deadlifted in a really long time, like throw it in there. I what I would do, like especially when I was training a lot, uh, when I was competing, and if I was like really fried, maybe from deadlifting conventionally because I'd been going like really heavy for a while, like that would be kind of like a great way. Cause I know I suck at sumo, so I'd have to go significantly lighter. 
like that would be a great time for me to like interject the the sumo mm-hmm. for a while. I'm like, oh, okay, I've been kind of fried from lifting really heavy on the conventional because I was starting to progress my weight up. Uh, now I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to feel achy joints. It's not, oh, you know what? Let me tr- let me teach myself something new that I'm not very good at, which is sumo deadlifting. I'm going, you know, probably a third of the load that I would be going when I'm doing conventional deadlift and just work on technique. Good time to do something like that. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, I, now years ago, I did this. I was uh, con- conventional deadlifting. That's all I ever did. Um, and at this time, I think my, my conventional deadlift max was somewhere around 540, 550, something like that. And then I was kind of stuck there. And one of my friends said, you should try sumo for a while. Just get good at sumo, then go back to conventional and see what happens. So I said, okay, that's a good idea. And I went sumo and I was, I, I started out, I don't think I went over three plates for a little while. It took me like four months to get up to 500 pounds on the sumo deadlift. So this was from deadlifting 540, 550 conventional. It took me like three to four months, maybe even five. It took me a little while of just practicing sumo before I could get up to 500 pounds, never went higher than that. And then I went back to conventional and my conventional was where it was before. And then I noticed I started going back up a conventional because I strengthened a little bit of a, a different recruitment pattern. So it's definitely a great strategy to get good at one and then practice the other, both with the deadlift and the squats. Next question is from Nathaniel L. Watson. Is three to five minutes of rest necessary for strength? I feel like it's too long. I feel recovered about the 1.30 to 2-minute mark. If you're looking for maximal strength within the lift, like if you want to be able to lift as much weight as you can for your desired rep range um, for each of your sets, the studies are pretty damn conclusive on this. About three minutes, maybe a little more, is what you want. Then Does that mean that you need to wait three, three minutes or more for the best results? In terms of muscle building, fat loss, sculpting, no, no, not at all. In fact, and it doesn't mean that you can't build strength resting only ninety minutes. Totally, or ninety seconds to two minutes. In fact, I rarely, rarely ever rest longer than uh, sixty to ninety seconds. I do. I rest when I rest three is normally the days when I'm chasing after PRs or Mm -hmm. really lifting heavy, and Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to make. I'd rather give myself a little extra rest than to give myself even the slightest bit of shortened rest. Right, so. The, uh, if you're looking for like a pump, yeah. Or... If I'm training normal, like I'm with you, I'm 90 seconds to two minutes tends to be towards the peak of what I'm resting. Uh, only when it it's a day when I know I'm going to be pushing my limits. When I know yeah. I'm going to try and pull something or squat something in the one to three rep range, and I know how heavy that's going to be for me, I give myself a good solid three to five minutes when I'm chasing that. Other than that, all the sets leading up to that. I can give myself the 90 second to two minute rest and feel pretty good, especially if you are are in good metabolic shape. Like if you have if your metabol, I mean, excuse me, if you're if you have a good gas tank where you've been training cardio and you're in good condition, like th- th- that's it's going to change per person, right? Mm-hmm. If you have somebody who always strength and power trains, they need all that time because they don't have much of a gas tank. Like that'll win somebody. Right. But if you're somebody who trains in the 15 to 20 rep range, or maybe you just came out of a phase where you're training 15 to 20 reps and you've got a great gas tank. And then all of a sudden you go to, you know, three reps or five reps. Like you're like, Oh, I'm cool. I'm ready to go again within, within a minute. This is also assuming people have two hours, two and a half hours to work out. Uh, this is something that we need to all also consider. Let's just say for argument's sake that three minutes is, you know, or four minute rest is just superior all the way around. That doesn't work for a lot of people. You know, mm. if you're going to the gym and you're going to do, you know, 10 or 15 total sets for your workout or more, you, that's gonna, that's a long ass time you're going to be in the gym. Like, what if you want to go in and be in there for an hour? Um, totally, it, it, it's fine. Rest, rest shorter. I sometimes I do 30 second rest because I got to hurry up because I got to take my kids to school. So I'm literally watching the clock. 30 seconds go. 30 seconds go. And I have to make the weight a lot lighter, but I do end up getting a really, really good pump, uh, with that shorter rest period. So I don't think it's, it's necessary. It's just, if you want to lift the most weight per set. Like if, yeah, your competitor, like a, you know, Olympic lifter or power lifter, there's definitely like those, those are there for a reason. Like that, those rest periods, like you do need that amount of rest to recover, to, to perform at a very high level. 
Uh, but in terms of like, so if you want to equate that to like a PR day, I could totally see that versus just like trying to build my strength. You can build strength with that 90 second, you know, to 60 second sort of rest period if you have good recovery, like individually. Yeah. yeah. But for body sculpting, um, if I had to pick, I think all the rest periods, anywhere between 30 seconds to three or four minutes are viable. But if, if for body sculpting, oftentimes the shorter rest periods, mm. and I'm not saying, I'm not saying, Super short rest periods. I'm talking 30 to 90 seconds, which I would consider the shorter one on the shorter end. I think that's a very viable rest period to look at for body sculpting, for shaping, for building the body. And most bodybuilders and competitors kind of rest in that rest period. They typically don't go longer than that. Honestly, now, like we talk about, we talk about uh, that's just just one of the variables that you can you can manipulate and change to change your workout. Right? Is messing with you know time and tempo is just mm -hmm. one of those things. Personally, for me. And, and I think in a perfect world, you have it the same way that we've programmed it for people where it's specific to a phase and you transition it out. But, you know, when you've been doing this for a really long time and you, and you understand your body, I kind of I kind of base it all off of like what I have time for that day. Like, you know, there's times when I'm doing 30 second rest periods. Well, the best time for me to do that is the days that I know I don't have a lot of time to be in the gym. I got somewhere to be, but I don't want to miss my workout. And it's like, hey, it's been a long time since I actually did a workout that was almost circuit style where I'm just moving, 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 moving. And then there's those times, and this is typically my Saturday and Sunday workouts because I don't have anywhere I have to be. It's I, I kind of mosey on over the gym. I walk on the treadmill, have maybe even a pre-workout on that day. I get myself psyched up. I, I'm going to be in the gym for two hours, maybe longer. It's going to be a great day. I'm going to take a long time on my rest periods mm -hmm. and focus on a movement. Maybe I'll spin... 30, 45 minutes just squatting or deadlifting alone and then even let myself recover. I've even done this before. I'll go over, do a crazy squat or deadlift session and where I'm really training myself hard, then go over, walk on the treadmill, let myself kind of relax a little bit, come back down and then kind of go into all the auxiliary work after that. Like, mm -hmm. So it really depends on your day and that this is a fun way to manipulate that. There's value to all rest periods and to manipulate that. Um, yeah, phasing it would be ideal and or periodizing it just like you would do with your training. Like I think that would be ideal. But there's I think there's nothing wrong with manipulating that based off of the time that you have for that day. I was trying to remember too, uh I remember hearing about gymnastic workouts, especially the rings and like the the time period, the rest periods that they had in between sets of doing their exercising on the rings was like substantially longer than I would have thought. And it, it does make sense because of how, you know, rigorous and how like how much they have to exert to hold these static poses and that their whole body is involved with that. Very demanding on the central nervous system. But yeah, I mean these these rest periods are definitely something that you want to make sure you pay attention to yeah. and it's appropriate. And they, and that's a lot of that is because they're trying to perfect their skill and, it's a skill, yeah. and technique, like Olympic lifters, Olympic lifters, they'll take long ass times sometimes in between sets and they'll have all day workouts. Now that's, that's a lot of that has to do with just perfecting the skill. And one of the first things that is out the window when you're fatigued is your technique and your skill. Right. Yeah. So if I'm training my endurance, my stamina, my toughness, then maybe it makes sense to have shorter rest periods. But if I'm training a skill, like let's say I'm squatting, like Adam's saying, and I want to perfect the skill of squatting, then I'm not necessarily training my stamina. I'm trying mm -hmm. to train the skill, so I may may rest a lot longer. But if I'm in the gym working out and I'm trying to train the fatigue, I'm trying to train the the pump, and I'm not and I'm confident enough of my skill to know that I'm not going to go terrible with my skill, and I can lower the weight enough to be okay with it, then the rest period is going to be a little yeah, shorter. Yeah, it depends on the intent you're coming in with, for sure. All right, next question here is from Don Black Mamba Twelve. What are your guys' thoughts on the use of artificial colors and flavors in food and supplements? Ah, I'm Ooh. so happy we got this question. Okay. The Black Mamba. Yeah, so <laughs> that's not the part. That's not yeah, the reason I'm happy. That's, that's, <laughs> so, so a couple things. First off, uh, colors, artificial colors and artificial flavors. It's more obvious for flavors, but for colors, those are used 100% to improve the experience of eating the food, the palatability of food. Um, and this is – it makes a big difference. Um, there's been a few – food experiments in the past where a company will come out with a food, change the color because they think it's funny or cool. 
and totally lose sales. Yeah, they did that with uh, they turned ketchup, ketchup ketchup green and black and black. Yeah, and nobody wanted to fucking buy. It. Oh, yeah. so it looks moldy. It yeah. tastes ex- good idea. It tastes exactly the same, right? Yeah. Same flavor. We saw that with uh, soda when they went clear. They went clear with Coke. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. So it's very important in terms of the palatability. So, so there's a huge oh, Pepsi, huge huge market. It was Pepsi that goes into in- improving the palatability of your food through its color. It's also there's also the texture. There's also, of course, the flavor, the sound it makes when you crunch into it. There's a a million things I could list right now. But color is a very, very big one. And there's always been controversy around artificial colors. Mm. Are they good or are they bad? Which I'll get into in in just a second. But the first thing I want to say is this. The engineering of food to make it hyper palatable, as enjoyable as that is, that's probably one of the main reasons why we have the obesity epidemic. I don't think it's necessarily sugar. I don't think it's Bro, that's necessarily not, that's carbs. Not even or, a, that's not even a question. Yeah. If we didn't know any of that science and we all we had was all the steak and baked potato and chicken and lettuce that we could eat to our blue in the face. We would be way less ain't obese. nobody sitting down fucking Netflixing and chilling and eating 10 pounds of lettuce. Yeah. Nobody's <laughs> doing that. Nobody's eating seven potatoes in one. It's just not happening. No, no. I mean, I think obesity would still be around, but not nearly to the rate that it is now. And it's all because... We've engineered foods using these artificial, uh, you know, scientific methods of improving their palatability. So that's part of my problem. I don't think we should ban them or anything like that. I think it's important to be aware, like to know, hey, when I'm eating these foods, I'm actually eating a food that's designed to be more like a drug, and yeah. that's going to make it harder for me to. Once you pop, you can't stop. Yeah, it's it's going to make it harder for me to eat in a way that's, that's you know beneficial you bring, to my you bring body. up that there would there would still not be any, and you're right. The, but the people that would be obese would be the super rich. Would be mm. the king or the queen who could sit on their throne and have all this thing delivered and tons of variety and variety. And what the truth is that that's how amazing of a time that we live in. That even even poor people could have these things that would be a, a luxury. Obesity is higher in, right. in, 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 with poverty now. Well, because because you it's cheap. You could go to the ninety nine cent menu on McDonald's and you could live off of that for yeah. fucking years. And you can buy box foods and all that. Right. stuff. Right, and, and just think about what a what a luxury that is that you for such a for such a cheap amount, right? For such a low amount of money that you could have these things that taste amazing. And so I, and I think that's what it is. It just promotes people eating like uncontrollably well, and, and nobody pays attention. And that's to what it. we ask for. We want that, right? We want that incredible experience. We want that numbing feeling that food can provide. So that's one of my big problems with artificial colors and flavors in foods. And th- now here's the other part that here's the other issue that I have because of their demand and because they sell so damn well, we tend to throw things in with less and less research. We rush them to the market and then when research comes out to says, wait a minute, there may be some issues with this kind of stuff. Now you have a huge market that's got lots of money, lots of lobby money, and they'll fight it tooth and nail uh, to make people believe that there is no other issue. There's no issues with these things. And that's not really true. Um, there are actual issues with food dyes. Now we know that uh, kids have, it, it has been linked to things like allergies, hyperactivity learning impairments, irritability, and aggressiveness in children. In particular, yellow number five, yellow number Mm. six, red number 40, um, and there's a couple others. Um, Those have been linked to behavioral issues in children. So they're not totally benign uh, things that you put in food. And I also want to say this. Nothing is totally benign. Everything has has some kind of an effect on you, even if it's just the effect of making you perceive something as more palatable. That is an effect. So when they use things like, oh, it's benign, it has no effects on you. No, obviously. Otherwise, that's why you put it in there. It's got an effect. But there's other effects as well. Um, there may be a cancer risk with certain other food dyes. Um, uh, and there is some evidence to suggest, it's not clear, that there may be some cancer risk with some of these things. Same thing with some of these flavors. There's all this controversy surrounding artificial flavors. Um, I, You know, I always say this. I would err on the side of natural. And, and here's why. It doesn't mean natural food is always going to be good for you doesn't mean that there aren't natural foods that are poisonous or can be really bad for you. That's not what I mean. But natural foods have been around with humans for a long time. So we kind of know what they do and what they don't do. We co-evolved with these foods. And I know we've- Typically less concentrated. Yeah, and, and I know we've modified natural foods through breeding and stuff like that. But breeding foods like, you know, breeding corn to become, to have more starch or breeding apples to have more sugar is different than- Taking, you know, using science to take chemicals and, and construct things literally in a lab that 
would never have existed before. There was no breeding process. It was like, here you go. We can create the most purple looking, you know, grape soda. Um, and it's purple, not because of anything from nature, but because we took these five chemicals, put them together and now it produces this color. So that's my thought on it. I think if you avoid at the very least, if you avoid artificial colors and flavors at the very least, you're probably going to develop a better relationship with food. You'll probably just eat more appropriately. Which I think that's the most important. It piece. is. Like, I think there's a, what we've done with this. Uh, and, and that's uh, what we need to argue. Where these questions get stemmed from. And I, and I know that, like, we, you know, this is one of the areas where we, like, disagree with our good buddy Lane, right? Like, Lane comes on the other end and, and, and tries to help uh, educate the, uh, I think, the fitness industry and let them know that, oh, there's this other side, the wellness side that is demonizing all these things that we science has proven is not that dangerous and is not going to kill you. And so there's a whole market in that. And then he takes the complete opposite. And I'm kind of down the middle with this. Like, absolutely, I'm somebody that indulges in things that have these things in it occasionally every once in a while. But what I'm aware of is what it promotes. And what it promotes is this, uh, it, 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 hyper, it totally hijacks your normal senses that tell your body tells you say okay I shouldn't eat anymore and to me that's the most dangerous totally. part totally the most dangerous part is not the dye or the artificial sweetener that's going to kill me if I because the amount of it that I would have to do would be so crazy to kill me or oh it could potentially cause cancer 20 years I'm less scared about that and I'm more concerned about the behaviors that follow it that's the thing and it's just like and it's a crazy analogy and I think it was Rob Wolf that actually used this analogy in one of his books when he talked about uh, comparing it to like porn. And it's like, would I, would I allow my son, and I think this way now having a son, like would I allow my son the access to Pornhub at, you know, 12 years old? Now I fucking use something like that. Now why wouldn't I allow my son to do that? It's not going to kill him. It's not going to cause ED right away. But does he have, does he have the awareness at that age to know what it could potentially cause in him. No, it's not going to... If he watched porn one time, is it going to kill him? Is he going to fuck him up for the rest of his life? Is he going to go down? Nah, Depends I don't... on the kind of porn, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that it's it's not so much the cause and effect of the of the just the porn hub the one time or the two times or whatever or it's not the cause and effect of the red dye or the or the uh, artificial sweeteners the one time it's the behaviors that follow that well look and it's the awareness that a lot of people do not have when mm -hmm. they consume it and what ends up happening is you have people like our friend Lane who are defending it because the science supports that, oh, it doesn't cause cancer. Oh, it's not going to kill it you. Does. It does. There's a lot less likelihood that you're going to be do it in moderation. Uh, that's where I'm, I'm always like hesitant because it, it is, it, it, it's like at such a higher level, like it just hijacks all your senses. And it's such a, you know, a heightened experience with food, having it at, you know, that sweet of a sweet and then going back to something that's maybe not, you know, it's a little more balanced. It's less like, uh, you know, powerful in terms of like your, the flavor and of it. Here how, how do how do you like manage like going back to just regular food? That's why I like the analogy of the porn thing. I know there's probably people going like, that's such a crazy analogy, but it's not. It's like the same thing. Like a kid who gets it introduced to that at a young age, they don't know what's crazy or too much and then what ends up happening in real life for them. Like when It changes they how they perceive sex. It changes how they perceive yep. that kind of stimulus. They become, it's hyper palatable visual stimulation. It's right. really no different. And look, here's the bottom line. And I'll make this argument all day and I'll, de I'll debate this with anyone. Do artificial sweeteners and colors and flavors and hyperpalatable foods cause cancer? Yes, 100%. Here's my argument, okay? Not directly, but you know what causes cancer? Obesity causes cancer. Poor health from overeating causes cancer. Do those things contribute to eating too much food that makes you obese that then causes heart disease and cancer? Yes. So they do cause cancer. No, not causing cancer directly, the artificial sweetener itself, although there, you know, some people make that argument. I'm not going to make that argument. My argument is this. If you get really obese, your risk of cancer goes up. So guess what? They cause cancer. End of discussion. Next question is from Ander Beth. What are some of your bucket list items? Bucket list items? You know yeah. what? I don't have a bucket list. This has changed for no? me. Uh, this is one of the things that I think has changed for me since having a son. Uh, most of my life, I, I lived an extremely selfish life and I had all kinds of bucket lists and things I wanted and things I want to do. And, you know, to be honest with you, I've, I've done most of that. There's not a lot of things that, um, 
I've I've wanted to do and I haven't gone and done. Now, is there something that somebody could bring up? Hey, would you like to do that? Well, yeah, that'd be cool to do. I'll probably go do it then. But it actually, I don't even think about this that much anymore. And I think more about uh, what I leave behind for my son and that that his generation, right? Like so, a lot of what I think about along the lines of like bucket list or things that I want to accomplish is more around the uh, setting up my legacy mm-hmm. and setting up uh, the generations underneath me. Like so, that's kind of like where all of where my thought is. I mean, I, I notice the difference in my own spending behaviors, the things that I, I look at to invest in, the, where where my brain is at is like, I don't even, there. I could literally, if that gets accomplished for me, uh, I'll die a happy man. Mm. Uh, I, like I, there's not certain things I have, like, cause a bucket list to me are things that like you want to accomplish before you die, right? Like that's really the definition of that, right? And for me, there's nothing that I selfishly want to accomplish before I die that would make me feel like, oh, I'm I'm there. I, I completed those things on my list. I feel happy. I can go. I can leave this place. I'm fine. I feel like that's already happened. If there's anything that feels unfinished for me, it's setting up my legacy and what what I pass down to my son and, and, and his family and what goes on beyond that. That, to me, is the, the biggest thing on my mind as far as a bucket list. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think I can't really think of anything that I'd want to do that if I really wanted to do it, I wouldn't just do it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like. When I think of a bucket list, I think of like things that are almost, you know, out of reach. Like, God, before I die, I want to be able to do this one Jump thing that's plane. so difficult or crazy. If I want to do something, I guess I'll do it. I mean, there's a few things I want to do that um, I don't know if they're necessarily my bucket list, but I'm pretty sure I'll be able to do them at some point or I, I will do them. Like, I'd love to visit the Shaolin Temple, um, you know, where Kung Fu was born. I think that's really cool. I've talked to Doug That's many, many times. As, random as fuck. I've right? talked to I've, something I've always wanted to do. <laughs> Little mantis work. Yeah. yeah. Now I don't want to learn kung fu. Okay. I just want to go and check it out. Um, I've talked to Doug before about you know visiting Japan. I've never been there before, um, yeah. but it was always a culture I was interested in because I did judo as a kid. I thought that was you know really really cool. Um, but there's really not much, mm-hmm. not much else I can I can think of that uh, you know is like something that's really I'd like to do a backpacking trip with you guys, but I don't know if Adam will let that happen. Yeah, he's always <laughs> I'm down, bro. It, you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, similar on this end. Only like I I do have a bit of traveling I'd like to do at, at some point. See some of you know the wonders of the world and see like you know the pyramids, see Machu Picchu and like certain like ancient structures and things like that that really fascinates me just to i don't know just out of my own curiosity and just like to see it in person i think would be super cool but other than that i mean there's some things that like every day um, i i have ideas i just want to accomplish a couple more things that that swim around in my head uh besides like the mega business stuff we're doing with mind pump but mainly (laughs) mainly it's this it's a joke as i say it out loud a lot of times like of writing this this you know, science fiction novel, but I'm, uh, if, if I have an idea for it, might as well get it out there. You know, it's like, it's going to happen and I'm going to do it, you know, before I die. But at that point, it's like, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'll, I'll pretty much accomplish You better hurry up before to. it all becomes true. Shit. You're going to be fucked like halfway through your science fiction and then, then, then it actually happens. Oh, if you're trying to predict. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. Cause technology and everything is going to take over <laughs> yeah. before He's I like, get there, dude. Oh no. He's like, it's the future. <laughs> People have computers in the, in the palm of their dude, hand. Yeah. And then, and then I put this yeah. in the VCR. Self-driving yeah. cars. <laughs> yeah. Everybody owns. I'll just have to keep like rewriting and updating, you know, yeah. for so like, like, hey, a little a- further out. Like, Hey asshole. That yeah. was five years ago. Yeah, Shit, yeah. The robots already took over. I think science fiction about this. I know. You're right. You're right. But what is, some intensity there, there. there. You know what? There is one thing that I can maybe put up there. Um, I don't know if it's a bucket list yet, but it, it does get me. It, it is something that every time I've talked about it, I get a little ex, kind of like excited. Like that would be kind of cool. So I don't know if it's bucket list. Bucket list. I have a yet, bucket list thing for you that you've said before. But what have I said? Yeah, I think you want to start a nonprofit. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, would, that would be a solid. Bucket but I know. List. I know I'm going to do that. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. I feel like. Well, I, I guess you could put there. that on yeah. a. Nup- I, I guess you could put that. Yeah, on just because a bucket list doesn't mean that it's not something you know you're not going to do. It's like you you haven't done and you know you want to do it before right. you die. Yeah, and I, I feel like you've expressed that. There's not a lot of things that I've expressed that I want to do that I haven't done yet. There's although there's plenty of things I haven't done, but. Yeah. There's not something like like that to me. I feel like you're very passionate about that. Yeah, like I've heard you talk about. No, that's it before. true. That's true. That's and, something I want to yeah, do. Yeah, it's right. funny. It's like I I flew an F-16 plane. You know, it's like where do I go from there? You're like I don't <laughs> think I fucking top that. So Fuck you, it's guy. like whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sarah, no, asshole. The, the yeah. other one I was gonna say is uh, hike um, uh, the uh, the Appalachian Trail. 
Um, I have a friend that did that. Do you guys know anybody that's ever done the Appalachian Trail? I do not. It's like... I've it, heard it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it takes a long time to do. It's like a month or two months. Yeah, or people yeah. Have, you have to like fly, like ship food into these different posts. Yeah. So that when you get there, you get food and stuff like that. I think that'd be kind of cool. Grow a beard and yeah, see how. Yeah. yeah, but you, you're, you're right. The, the nonprofit, that's something that I think uh, that I could put. If I had to put something on a bucket list, it would be that. Hmm. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com. That's where you can get all of our free resources and free guides. Uh, you can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>